Welcome to another Melbourne Cocoa Heads presentation. Recorded September the 15th, 2011. In this session, Jeff Bonds talks about his experience developing native iPhone applications in JavaScript using App Accelerator Titanium. I just decided to uh, volunteer to do this app. I've been doing some development in App Accelerator Titanium. I'm a web developer by trade, uh, so I've been doing web development for you know, 15 years or something like that. Uh, last year, I wanted to get into building apps, but I did probably what a lot of other people do. They go to the boot camp and they buy all the books and they try to learn Objective-C and they pull out their old C thing from college and I thought, wow. So I looked around and uh, found this framework which was, you know, and there was a whole host of them, we'll kind of go through them, and I thought, listen, this could be a sweet spot for what I wanted to do. So I've been working with it off and on for 15 months and I thought, listen, I know you guys are not going to be converted. Nobody's going to come, and I'm probably not even going to try to convert you um, to say this is a really good tool. We should be using it. But in my experience, it's always good to learn about what other technologies are out there, what people are doing, and I'm going to keep it. I'm going to actually go kind of geeky so you can see uh, how they did what they did and what it's actually doing under the covers. So that's kind of the goal of tonight. Um, so is cross-platform for real? Uh, you know. Every time there's a new development platform, everybody says, yes, it's, we could do cross-platform, and when you've lost as much hair as I have, you know that it never works, right? I mean, I, I was rattling them off of like what they, you know, Java, Flash, Air, the web browsers, thin clients, you know, it's always going to be right once, run everywhere, does it work, and it's more often hype than not, and there's a lot of hype in what they're doing. So what's happening in the A? Uh, phone world or the tablet world right now is, you know, there's some unified stuff. Adobe's working on some stuff, which you guys probably know about. Um, the ones that you may or may not have heard of, which are probably a bit older than that, are Accelerator, which I'll show you tonight so you can see it. Phone Gap's another framework. We're on Connect. There's one Teton something. There's probably other ones that are out there. Um, the ones that really kind of came out as they start out as web wrappers, right? So, Originally, it was like, I want to build an app, but I don't know how to program, so I'll just do a web UI view, and I'll just put my CSS and my JavaScript in it. And then somebody figured out, well, wait a minute, I can actually do some stuff in JavaScript to make things happen on the phone. And that's really where a lot of this stuff came from. So does it work? Can you write once, run anywhere? Can you actually write one thing and have it run on anywhere? And with native performance, if you think it's possible, let's go back to 1995. <laughs> you are clueless. It doesn't work that way. So um, what, we, what I have found is uh, each platform has its own pain points. They're always going to have their own pain points. And I'll kind of go through those today and what works and what doesn't. Now, I'm going to talk tonight about Accelerator Titanium. So Accelerator is the company. Uh, based out of California. They're actually pretty smart guys um, who have been doing this for a while. The basic concept is you can write stuff in, they say HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's really JavaScript. Uh, any HTML and CSS stuff is just WebView stuff. But you'll see how they actually write JavaScript, and that's your application. And it goes through their API, which then talks to a bridge. And on Android apps, it's a JavaScript to Java Bridge, which is using the Rhino engine. If any of you guys have done web development, you probably have heard of Rhino. It's been around forever. They're actually switching that to go to the new V8 engine for performance reasons. And then it compiles from uh, JavaScript to Objective-C. Uh, and they've got a, a layer in there. So it's actually being interpreted and going native. And I'll get into some examples of how they do modules so you can actually see how the objects line up, if you will. By the way, I'm going to talk fast, because that's how I talk. Um, if you have any questions as I'm going through or something's not clear, just feel free to blurt them out, raise your hand. I probably won't see it, so just yell. Um, all right, so if you wanted to get started with Titanium like I did 15 months ago or something like that, you'd go out and do some research and find these things. Uh, it's actually a free product, um, so you can just go to accelerator.com and you download it. Now when you, when you download it, if you will, um, they, Accelerator got $15 million in funding or something over the past years, and they bought a company called Aptana, which I'd never heard of before. Has anybody used their IDE? 
Yeah, so the, the, the first guys I've ever heard actually heard of it before they bought it, but they bought that and um, they created their own IDE which is based on Eclipse and it's called Titanium Studio. So now if you go to the App Accelerator website, you download Titanium Studio and it does everything magically for you. But um, they used to have this little window called uh, Titanium Developer which was um, really just shells to the command line that did stuff. And I'll kind of go through, you'll be able to see it in the command line. But now you go and you download it, Accelerator has two products. They've got a desktop product and a mobile product. Um, so with a desktop product you can actually write in JavaScript and it will compile to every uh, desktop thing and it's actually got things in the App Store, in the Apple App Store, so they've been approved for that. Um, their mobile product, everything that they write is open source, so you can actually go to GitHub and check it out and fork it and do whatever you want to, um, which I actually recommend because it is pretty interesting code, and I'll, but I'll talk about the disadvantages of it well. Um, but most of the serious developers that I have come across, they just use the command line tools for it. So it's a lot of Python scripts and things like that that do things in the background, magic stuff. But it's going to be easiest if I show you what it actually does, I think, because it'll make a lot more sense. So let's go to the demo. All right, so this is Titanium Studio, which is an Eclipse-based IDE. Until about two weeks ago, it was such a piece of crap <laughs> that I can't imagine why they even released it. I went, I was using command line tools, so I hadn't gone into it. This, they, they've done about four point releases since they released it a couple months ago, so now it's actually stable enough that I can use it every day. Um, has anybody done, well actually, who knows JavaScript in the room? Is that pretty much everybody, right? So this should be pretty familiar to JavaScript developers. You go into Titanium, you create a project. I've created a little project called Hello World. And it generates a project structure for you, okay? So they create a little folder for Android and a folder for iPhone. And that's where some of your resources are. So if I open the iPhone folder, I get, uh, you know, my icon, my default icon, my retina default icon, and then if I'm doing an iPad app within that. Within the Android folder, it's the same thing. I've got images, and then, this is the joy of Android. <laughs> <laughs> this list isn't going to get any smaller, right? Over time, this is all my different screen resolutions, and then all the artifacts within that, okay? Developing for Android is such a pain. Who's done Android development? Is it like just the biggest world of pain? Or is it, is it just me? Am I doing it wrong? It's painful. Anyway, within that, uh, that's the project structure, but what they have then is just a little JavaScript file. So it starts with this little file called app.js. And that's what runs when the project starts, magically. Starts with app.js. And what you can do in it is this is all JavaScript. So first line is they've got this namespace, JavaScript namespace we call titanium. And you just call objects in that and you call factories in it to get objects. So first line is titanium.ui.set background color. Pretty easy. And then I'm going to create a tab group. This is the default project. So var tab group equals titanium.ui.create tab group factory pattern get this tab group back, right, which is mapped to a native object in both worlds, the Android and the iOS. And I'm going to create a window, so win1 equals titanium.ui.create window, and you can pass it JSON to set the properties within it, so I'll give it a title and a background color. Create a tab with an image, title, and what window is going to open when I click that tab. And I just go down, I create a label, label one, titanium.ui.create label. There's no interface builder in here, it's all grid stuff, so I could set height width where it's going to appear on the screen. Sorry? Uh, none in here, but it uses the same attributes. And you can use what's called JSS, which I have never actually heard of, but it's like a Java-based CSS thing and you can include that in your library and do it. But I haven't done it. I just have constants and factories and settle it that way. Um, text line, so we've got all these things. So that creates the first window. 
down in here, I create a second window and a tab, and then I just add the tabs to my tab group, and I open my tab group, which opens my window. So if I run this in the iPhone simulator directly from here, there you go. Little tiny app. The fun stuff is to watch what the console does, because it's basically compiling it and doing all this weird translation stuff. But it does bring up a little tiny app. It's native. Native controls. And I'll show, it'll show you how it does that somehow. Um, so I've got my window one, my two tabs, <coughs> click on them, goes back and forth. Right? Pretty interesting. Go down to my Android, and there it is. Same thing, two tabs. Window one, window two. All right. So how does it, and you basically can extend this language. So they've got a full, I'll just go down here and start to type. So let's say I wanted to create a button. My titanium namespace, which can be ti.ui.create. And if I start to do type ahead, you can see all the stuff that it's got. Uh, animations, 3D transformations, cover flow views, dashboards, item, the email dialogues, blah, blah, blah. And you'll, you know, if you worked in the iOS world, which I haven't enough, you'll know that these are all, you know, pretty standard kind of thing. So if I just go down here and start to create button, and I'll pass it some JSON, I'll give it a title. All right, I'll put a height on it. Give it a width. Uh, I'll put it on my grid, so I'll make it 10 pixels from the top and uh, 15 pixels from the left. There we go. And I want to make that button do something. So they've got event listeners. Add event listener, and I've got all these predefined events. I'll do a click. You can also do tap, swipe. Every control has its own event listeners, which are listed in the API. And I pass it a JavaScript function, which is what do I want to do when somebody does that? Save it. Oh, I gotta add it to my window. Win one dot add button. Refire it up in my iPhone simulator. There you go. Hello world. Go back to my Android, back out. Open it again. Oh, fast dev is enabled, disabled. Normally it would just do it, I'd have to rebuild it now, and that takes absolutely forever on Android, but we'll do that. And it'll come up. So you can do different things. They've got uh, different, uh, once you look into the API, it would be very familiar with anybody who's done UI development. There's actually been nothing that I've found that I wanted to do that I couldn't do in this natively. Now, sometimes you have to expand objects. Go ahead. What about uh, more advanced uh, view layout? Um, and how does it do with portrait this landscape? Yep. It, so it's the same kind of thing. It's all event listeners. So as soon as somebody turns it, it'll fire an event. And then you just redraw your screen. So you'll have an event listener, which is, you know, I've got my grid pattern. So here's how it's going to do. And you can use percentages and things like that. And it's got uh, like native uh, iPad controls and things like that. So it's got split view within there, which obviously doesn't work on Android. Um, so the whole idea of having one right once run everywhere in a native experience doesn't actually work. You have all these if statements of if platform equals Android, use these Android controls. If it's iPad, use these kind of controls within that. So. What about um, collocation updates? Like that? To? Yeah, so you've got location updates. Can you yep. So they've got, uh, I'll go through the API a little bit, but they've got all these different things. So they've got this location object. And you can basically register as listeners on that. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I mean that's, uh, if I start to type it and say, uh, actually I'll just go ti dot uh, geo location dot, and you can see it's got all these fire event, uh, get current heading, get current position, it'll fire events of location update when you do that. Um, it's not as good, they've added background services as well, but there are some things, I know one of the big ones that somebody's writing a module for is, I forget what it is, get significant location change or something like that, which is, you know, the lowest power kind of thing, but uh, I haven't done any, that many geolocation apps, so it hasn't been that much of a problem. How quickly do they adapt to new APIs? Huh? How quickly do they bring them on the right Not way? quick enough. <laughs> That's one of my problems, is it, um, because they actually, I mean, they're just like us. They get the source code, they get the beta releases the same time we do. So they can add it as fast as they want to, right? So they're probably working now on iCloud kind of things for when it's released, but they're always behind. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't check that code in. Exactly. And that's, it's all public. So that's the problem, is that it's not. But they're pretty quick. Um, but there's probably a two month delay with all that stuff. So. Sorry? Yep. Yep. They've got wrappers around Core Data. So they've got this thing, um, uh, app.properties. And you can basically set and call different things. They've got, uh, that's probably not, anything else you want to see in the demo? I'll walk out and show you the, the API. Because that's really where the power of it is. <laughs> Um, so this is their API documentation, you know, Accelerometer, they've got their own analytics module because the world needs another one. <laughs> um, Android specific things, uh, there's a lot of Android stuff in there because of all the background stuff you can do on it and there's different iOS stuff. Uh, Codex, context database, they've got their own Facebook wrapper. Files, you can read and write to files, geolocations, you can write your own gestures, um, locale, media, obviously, network stuff, so they've got, um, they do it really uh, very Ajaxy. As a JavaScript guy, I came, you know, they've got this XHR object. You can just go get stuff and then you get JSON back and because it's all the JavaScript, it's just there. So it's actually really, really easy to connect to back-end web services. Um, and then here's all the UI stuff. So I was talking, you know, they've got animations within that. Uh, buttons, cover flow views, you know, all this stuff should be pretty familiar to anybody who's worked with it. Uh, I don't think they've got their own custom stuff, but they do have their own unique UI Android, UI OS, UI iPad, right, which are the specific things that are not going to work on Android, you know, you can't <coughs> just do that. So they do break it out, and they've also got stuff into Yahoo. So they've got a pretty extensive API of stuff. If it doesn't work, or if you can't find what you want, you can always expand it. So they include this thing called the Kitchen Sink, which is an app, which is basically everything that it does, it's got sample code for. And the biggest mistake I made when I was trying to learn this was that I looked at the documentation online, which is always behind because it's an open source project. So it's like two releases behind and there's no file system stuff, you know, for example, because it's over here. Um, but if you ever want to get familiar with what it can do, just download the Kitchen Sink app, check it out from GitHub, uh, compile it, and it actually does everything that's on there. So, uh, and on both platforms, which is pretty interesting. I mean, they've got specific stuff of this will only work on iOS, so it doesn't show on the Android app, but it does work. Uh, I talked about all the APIs. You can go look them up. There's a lot of them. So I thought I'd get into something a little more deep so you can see kind of how, it, and this is my understanding of it. I'm not a very good, I mean, I'm basically surface level Objective-C guy, so you guys are gonna, you could ask me any question about this and I won't be able to answer it, but you can extend their project using modules and that gives you a good idea of how they actually make all this stuff tie together, at least on the iOS platform, and then it, you can write your own modules in Java as well for Android, but, um, I'll just show you one more thing. So when I ran that app, I'll just pick another one of my apps. So let's go in here and I'll pick one of my apps. 
This is my What Should I Wear project, which is my wife's beautiful website. If you guys were females between the 18, age of 18 and 40, you'd be interested. Um, I've got my different... Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty... Yeah. <laughs> Um, but what it does is it actually when I when I build this, you can actually see it's generating an Xcode project in the background. So it's taken all my stuff and it's got all these Python scripts that go out and build this Xcode project. Now I could actually, if I knew anything about Xcode, <laughs> I can you can actually open that and debug the project and do everything you want to in Xcode. But there's so many layers. It's just a nightmare, but that's how it does it. I mean, this is how it's doing everything, is it actually builds this Xcode project. So... Is the code readable at all? Sorry? Is the code, generated code readable at all? Readable? Yeah, yeah, you can read it. It's all in there. Your JavaScript tying to these things, and how it ties to it is actually how it does this. So, they've got this extension, you can create your own modules for it, which gives you an idea of how their code works. So. If you wanted to create a module, you run this script which creates this Xcode project. You open up the Xcode project and what you would do is they've got all these files out there. Um, but basically, objects are exposed to JavaScript are type TI proxy, titanium proxy, right? So they've got this overriding object which is smart enough that if you write JavaScript in their thing, it just calls methods on that. So you just do an interface of TI proxy and then your implementation just includes that and you can do it. So what you do, or what they've done, is they've just got this JavaScript method wrapper around things that if you type JavaScript and you say call a method on this object, it's just going to pass it through to some method name in your C code. Same thing with properties. To expose a JavaScript property, you just make it a property, right? Non-atomic read, write, assign. They've got this funky data conversion returns that they do it, right? So they've got all these different utilities, which are in TI utilities, which basically take, you know, floats and convert them to JavaScript floats. And they've got, I mean, it's amazing the amount of return types you get files, rectangles, all these coordinate systems that they come back and they can come back as JavaScript objects. Um, and you pass them in as well. So they do this translation of data so that Objective-C and it can handle it. Um, you would have noticed that I didn't do any memory management in my JavaScript code because it does it all for you. Does it loop? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that my apps leak because I didn't know what I was doing because I followed the documentation. <laughs> but when you actually talk to the developers, there's ways to do that. So. Titanium, titanium handles the object creation because it's got all these proxy objects which are out there and you can only create stuff through a factory. So in your JavaScript, let's say, okay, well, I've got to require my module and I want to create my JavaScript object foo, so I'm going to call my module and say create foo. And then I pass it the parameters. And what, it, what titanium actually does in the back background is it goes, okay, com test. So I'm going to look for a class called com test foo proxy. And then I'm going to call, I'm basically going to return one of those objects. So it's doing the creation for you. Oops. You need to set up your objects as auto release in Objective C. And the problem is, is if there's any reference to your code that you don't actually clean up in JavaScript, it's never going to get auto released. Right? So, I'm, I mean, if I'm coming in and I'm Somebody who just owns JavaScript, right? Who cares in the browser? I'll just create objects. So it doesn't release really automatically when it pulls out a script? No. Because it's not this, well, actually, that's not true. The way that they do threading is a bit weird as well. Um, basically, everything's on one thread unless you give it a new URL to your JavaScript file, which is in its own thread. So if you close that thread, if you say, I'm closing that window, it will take it out of scope. So that does work. That's one of their things for memory management. Unless you've actually referenced something from that window in your main thread, and then it won't. So that's why it can, it can leak. And the problem is you have no way of knowing that it's leaking, right? I mean, titanium module's not gonna tell me that it's leaking, right? I'll just keep using my app. Performance is really good. 
It's it's native stuff. I mean, it's pretty quick. Uh, I'm sure you can, but I don't know how. Yeah, it's an Xcode project, so you can do it um, within that. I mean, but most people who are using this tool are they're never leaving Titanium Studio. You can install it directly to your phone. It'll just put it in iTunes and and do that. And you can debug it through Titanium Studio and see the JavaScript objects, but you never know what's really going on under the covers. So it's generating the object you see falsely. Yeah. Yep. So you can just pretty much take that over. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But most of them are, I mean, most of the stuff you're doing is calling. Most of the stuff you're doing, though, is calling the proxies, right? So you can, I mean, you can do anything you want to because it's open source. So if I see something, you can go in and change it. But that's beyond my ability. So, all right. Well, the funny thing is, is that, um, you know, in order to be a really good titanium developer, you really got to know iOS and Java. And then why are you using <laughs> So, um, yeah, so, uh, and then the way that they do event handlers as well is, you, you know, I, you saw that I did the add event, uh, add event listener, and then you call an event. It's the same kind of thing. You just write these magic things in your class. And when somebody types that into JavaScript, it just shoots off and calls that method. You know, when I add it, it listens that. When I remove it, it does that. And there's another one, fire event. What kind of event did this fire and do that? So I thought that this stuff is, would be interesting to you guys because it's kind of, this is how somebody has thought, I'm going to make an extendable module that people can build off within that. And it's, I think it's, you know, works pretty well. Um, in addition to proxies, then there's view proxies, which are really UI proxy, so it's that kind of thing, and that's got a whole additional bunch of um, methods and things you can override, so it's a lot more complicated. Um, but if you want to have a look, you'll never find this on Google for some reason it never gets indexed, but this is the best reference for the cool titanium stuff is wiki.appcelerator.org. But if you do a search on Appcelerator and ask any question, you get shot to their developer forum, which is crap. So downsides, I talked about documentation. It's, it's really not up to date. Um, most of the, the good developers just read the source code because that's the truth, right? So what methods can I call on those objects? I just read the Objective-C source code. Um, app size, they're all really big. I think the minimum size on a Android is about two meg. Minimum size on a iOS, I think is about three meg. So. You can't make really small, itty-bitty apps, Sean. <laughs> um, they do this, uh, they give you the kitchen sink, right, which is really good, and all the examples work in there, and it's all pretty cool. And then you try to mash two together, like you have to to make cool code, and all of a sudden, oh, that property doesn't get set if it's in this context and thing. There's all these dark corners that you go into where it's like, but it works. If I take this object out and do it, it works, but then if I put this object in there, then it doesn't work. And you have no way of knowing unless you're going to the source code. So they've got a real quality problem if you want to do really deep apps. And it just feels hacky. Like there's weird things of, I haven't looked at the code enough, but you kind of get this feeling of like they're setting timeouts for things to happen of like, well, I'll just wait 100 milliseconds because then it doesn't do it. There's just all this kind of stuff that just doesn't feel right about it. Like, it'll, it'll work really well until I start clicking fast, and then all of a sudden it freezes up and gets behind, and then it comes back and clicks a lot. Like, and it's just, you know, but if you set 100, and some of the questions that they, people ask, it, so um, you can never debug a crash because it's going through their stack, right? Do I know what the NS view proxy good enough SQL database object did? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, Android development is still fragmented and totally screwed, but that's, I think that's just all Android development, so they haven't fixed anything there. There's no magic formula. You gotta write something for every screen size, and because it's got absolute pixels, you gotta write basically a layout manager for every single screen size that's within it. It's terrible. Um, release timing, we talked about that. I got caught out when I, OS 4 came out. Uh, turns out that there, any app that was written in titanium when OS 4 came out crashed until you got the new version up. But they didn't release theirs until Apple did, 
and then I had to fix my code, which took three days. And then I had to put it in the App Store approval store with everybody else who was doing that, which took 10 days. So I had users who basically couldn't use my app for 15 days. That was nice. I was happy about that. Um, and it, let's face it, it's still not native. I mean, there's stuff that's in there that, although it, it feels almost always right, 85%, there's 15% that's just not right. Um, how does Accelerator make money? Uh, I have no idea. I really don't get their business. I mean, it's kind of that freemium model, and they have like, you know, had like 80,000 downloads, and there's 20,000 apps. Um, but they're, they charge, for your, if you're an indie developer, they charge you 50 bucks a month. And there was a big controversy because they released this new TI Studio. It was the first time they had integrated debugging where you could set, you know, like real debugging with breakpoints and things. And you, but you only got it if you were an indie developer. And so everybody's like, you're paying me to be debug my apps. So they took that thing away. But there's really not any reason to join these things, but yet they push this professional developer on you thing where you're like, really, I'm going to pay 200 bucks a month to you to get premium support on this thing where I can actually go and answer, ask a question and I'll get it answered in two days. And I had some problems where I joined for a month because I thought, uh, you know, I was learning and trying to figure it out. And it was like, yeah, okay, send us the exact example that you're using for that, okay, and bring it down to its simplest example where it breaks. And, you know, I don't have time to be doing that. You know, like it's, it was just, it just feels weird. Their support's bad. It's not good. But I think where their play is, like if you look at the apps that they've developed, um, NBC iPad app is Accelerator. Um, eBay and PayPal are both investors in them, so some of their app stuff is built in that. Um, they, they make a play at the corporate end where there's an executive there, and especially in America where Android proliferation is a lot more, people are not going to build. And they, they, some people think if we can build it all in one thing, we'll do it. And I think that's where their play is, kind of that high-end market. But it is really good for little tiny apps, little simple apps that don't have to do much. It's good, you know. They've got animations, they've got all the stuff. So little simple apps, it's really, really good. Give me an example of sweet spot, sweet spot. Sorry? That is, that is good as well. I would say that that's probably too complicated for what they want to do. Um, I'm trying, I mean, like Twitter apps. They've got one of their examples is twi Twitanium or something like that. And that's their go to app for you know, how you should structure your code. And it is good, but it's like, you know, it's a simple little app. Right? There's not that much to it. You're making calls. I use my fantasy football app for American fantasy football. You know, footy tips would be a good one. You know, I mean, how complicated is it? It's tables and updating stuff, and I'm sending stuff back and forth to the server. So that would be like a good, simple app that would do it. But iPad apps, probably less. And right? they're trying to make a play into the iPad space. It's not, I mean, iPad apps are too dynamic. They do have. They, the other thing that they sell in here is they've got all these additional uh, modules that you can buy that they support. So a web store kit, uh, there's some gaming stuff, uh, 2D engines and things like that that you can get in addition to it. But I've never used any of those. I've never needed to. So um, yeah. Uh, so that's <coughs> overall. I think they get a lot more traction in the U.S. because the Android's a lot more there, and because they're probably selling into big uh, corporations that already have web developers that don't need to retrain. Right, so then I, I don't think I don't ever see them getting a big traction in Australia necessarily, but it's always good to know what tools are out there. So, any other questions? That's it for me. There's one here. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Yep. So you're, you're shipping a couple of apps. Yep. Are they just hobby apps, or are you doing commercial apps with these? Uh, I did one commercial app, uh, which was an iPad app, and that was a mistake. <laughs> um, probably, to be honest, if I, if I did that app now, I could do it much better. But coming from where I came from, I crammed every, I, you know, I used the sledgehammer that was the web view um, for a lot of stuff, because that's my knowledge. Um, I think it could come a long way. But uh, I've just done another app 
the What Should I Wear app, and that's fine. And there's a lot of projects that I'd be fine with doing it. And you're you publishing know. your crossplay platforms? Uh, I haven't Android done I haven't done any Android ones yet because I've needed. I've done Android coding, and I've got stuff within that, but I haven't done it in anger to be able to actually do a submission to an app store yet. So. So you're not getting the full win yet. No, for me it was it was not about it. Never was about cross platform for me. It was always about using my skills as a JavaScript developer without having to learn up on Object to C. No, so. It's really odd you spoke about the fact you chose it because when you were looking at the scary whole thing, you spent a lot. You invested a hell of a lot of time. Yeah. How do you think you invested that time into Object to C and the native platforms? Uh, I would have never gotten my apps out as quick. Uh, longer term, there's no question that you'd probably be better off learning Objective-C, but I've actually done that now through this, so it's kind of dragged me in to that. Not necessarily that I wanted to. You know, I would have loved to just stand at this nice JavaScript level, but um, I've had to learn about some of those things as I went to it. So. Um, I think for people who are starting out, if you're going to say, listen, I'm going to learn JavaScript or learn Objective-C, it's fine. But if you just, you know, if I was going to just do a quick and dirty app for three months and I got to pound it out and I know JavaScript, why not? I'd give it a go. So. Any other questions? It's interesting, like, how we've discussed it, you clients, like, one thing I have read that was really, like, the Objective-C ones and apps. But, um, I think it depends on the app. Um, it also depends on the client. You know, if they, probably more on the app. How native do they want me to be? I mean, Android development in itself is you got to know the Android paradigm. Right, so there's a difference there as well. You just need to be an Android user, which I haven't been enough of to actually know what I'm doing enough. Um, and are you going to get a client who's going to pay for both? And is he the experience that much? Like I said, for simple apps, tab manager apps, for example, with five different windows, because I know Titanium, it would be an easy thing for me. But I also know Java. And I've gone into the SDK of Android and thought, well, it's just, I mean, it's a world of pain no matter what you do. So if I can abstract it out to something that's a bit easier, then I'll do it that way. Oh, just, I mean, if you want to get it started, you still need to know the, I mean, the code APIs. You kind of do. For some reason, and maybe this was just me, I found when I went to the, um, when I went to my classes and things like that, I got really overwhelmed by the Apple APIs. I think because it was so much. I mean, there's so much more than just the core UI stuff, whereas Titanium didn't overwhelm me. So I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just the method names are shorter or something. Um, or I didn't have to worry about memory management or something along those lines. So, uh, and I could trace everything back to something that I saw on the phone. And I guess I, because I had an app in mind, I just went, oh, well, these are the only things I care about. I don't care about anything else. So it seemed easier for me, but that might just be me. Um, I gotta figure out what it is first. <laughs> but you know, honestly, right now I wouldn't have the skills. It would take me forever to to skill up enough to actually write an Objective C app. I think if it, if it was you know like as ambitious as the projects that I've done in the past, whereas with this I probably could. But like you said, I've invested a lot of time in it now, so I know how to do it, kind of thing. I think, if, I think it's easy to underestimate what that learning curve was like. Yeah. Now that you're well past it, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, can people remember back to kind of scratching their heads, looking at this big ball of APIs and, and memory management and you know, C dialect and the tool chain and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it's not easy for a lot of people. So if you know a bit of JavaScript, this might seem to work. Yeah, especially when you're coming out. I think I said the, the guys who have been doing web development for 15 years, and it's like, I can pick up these tools and use JavaScript. And I can look. I got an app, you know. I, I push a button and there's an app on the screen. Whereas it's like, oh, I got to learn it. You know, it's just different. Is the question more that this this framework's helped you bridge the gap somewhat? So oh, it definitely has. It definitely has. Yeah. Try, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm still doing a lot of web development as well. So it's not like I'm out of that world. I haven't been able to dedicate myself to. Do that. So it's really good for prototyping. 
Yeah, it's actually real. I think it's really good for prototyping. For you know, you can just pound stuff out really quickly, and even if it's disposable, it would be really good for that. You can certainly say, I know that we started to learn iPhone stuff at the same time. He goes, "Is that bad?" A lot faster. So there you go. All right. That's it. Well, That's it. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Many thanks to Jeff for presenting this month. Thanks also to PlayUp for hosting this month's event. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, visit us on the web at melbournecocoaheads.com or follow Melbourne Cocoa on Twitter.